And thank you very much to Wardy as well for uh, putting together today, because I know how much time and effort these conferences take to put together. So yeah, thank you very much, Wardy. Round of applause. <laughs> very good. Very good. So um, Equitise is an equity crowdfunding platform which has been operating in New Zealand. Um, we, we focus mainly on uh, private company opportunities, which are pre-revenue, but all the way up to uh, now coming back into Australia. Uh, recently, uh, IP opportunities as well. So we've recently just received uh, a retail uh, for sale license through an authorised rep uh, from a company down in Melbourne. So my background is in uh, Deloitte in corporate finance. I actually worked with Dean, uh, who spoke this morning from uh, Tech Sydney. Uh, we sold that business uh, to Yahoo 7 and advised on that transaction. And that's kind of where I got my, my, uh, my flair for tech and, and wanting to quit Deloitte actually and uh, start a new business, which, which was equitized. So he, he facilitated that for me. Um, Johnny Wilkinson, uh, not the real Johnny Wilkinson. Um, younger, arguably not as good looking, I don't know. Uh, and uh, doesn't, doesn't have a weird accent. Uh, but Johnny's got a background in public markets uh, at Citigroup. Uh, and he's sort of been helping a lot with this uh, IFSL process and, and licensing uh, recently. Um, so I'll, I'll run you through the story of where we've come from because uh, it's been influenced a lot by uh, the change in regs or, or the lack thereof in change in, change in regs uh, in the Australian market. Um, in 2014, we, we both quit our jobs uh, in corporate and went through a FinTech accelerator program, uh, which was with Australasian Wealth Investments Limited. Uh, they are essentially, um, they own assets like Intelligent Investor and, and that sort of thing. Uh, they were Australia's first FinTech accelerator. Um, so they, they seeded us and took us all the way through to building up the technology and, and that sort of thing. Um, by the time we got to the back end of 2014, we, we thought we'd have a change in legislation. Uh, CAMAC had been uh, putting together a paper uh, and Johnny and I were hopeful that we could launch our business in Australia. Uh, however, this just didn't really eventuate. Uh, so we had to sort of put our heads together and think, you know, what do we do now? We've just spent all this money building a platform and, and we don't have any regulations to actually launch it into this, this country. Uh, so we raised some more money from Tankstra Ventures and Bridgeline Capital uh, and we flew over to New Zealand where the FMA, uh, the regulator over there, had just changed our regulations. So we applied for a licence there, we got it, uh, and we lived out of a youth hostel uh, for our first year in Auckland. Uh, which was interesting, riding up and down the streets, uh, putting a suit on each day and trying to convince people to trust an Australian who's selling a New Zealand product, uh, which worked. Um, we got there and uh, we closed a, a series of transactions in, in that first year and proved out the technology and the team and, and that sort of thing, which is what investors want to see. Uh, at the back end of 2015, we came back to Australia. Uh, we tapped Investec on the shoulder and said, you know, can you please invest in our business? We're that out of money. Um, and they saw real strategic alignment in what, what we're doing in the Australian market and wanted to invest in our business and help us grow it back into Australia. So that's kind of where we're at now. Um, they've invested and uh, now hold about 20% of the business. And uh, Johnny and I have been back in Australia for a year, so we're both quite happy. Um, so we've now got a team in New Zealand. Uh, over the last 12 months or 18 months, we've raised over $12 million. Uh, for private companies in both uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, there's a slight sort of tweak towards New Zealand there, purely because we've been spending more time in that market. Uh, we've closed capital raisings now for 18 different companies, not 17. Uh, one closed yesterday, which was good for us, getting some more commissions, so we don't get as much cash, investors' money. Uh, and we've got 673 unique investors in the platform. So registered investors who have validated their ID, it's probably up around six or 7,000 now. Uh, but 673 people have sort of made an investment and hold uh, equity through Equitize. Um, I think about 15 of those people have invested in every single transaction. So you can really start to see the, the stickiness of investor growth uh, when sort of this, these platforms are opened up to, to retail and sophisticated investors. Uh, what I'm going to be speaking about today are two different types of equity crowdfunding and two different platforms which have been operating globally uh, quite successfully, uh, both of which we've spent a lot of time analysing uh, since we started our business back in 2014 to, to try and pick a model which would work for our geography and uh, our, our regulations uh, back in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Crowdcube um, 
has a direct equity crowdfunding model, uh, which we like to call it, sort of traditional equity crowdfunding. Um, and when I say traditional, it's uh, the issuer uh, engaging directly with the intermediary or Crowdcube directly. Uh, Crowdcube performs uh, DD on those opportunities. They go through and do police checks, they go and look at the information memorandum, uh, they look at the financial models, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, it's essentially a boutique advisory house. Um, not hugely scalable, but still more scalable than the traditional ways of raising capital. Uh, the second model, which uh, is really interesting, uh, we think and much more scalable, is a business called AngelList. Um, AngelList is based in the US. Uh, they use syndicated investment uh, to close out rounds of capital. So essentially a syndicate on, on AngelList is an individual, uh, normally an angel, who's got a really high profile in the States for investing in uh, you know, mobile apps or you know, platforms like Brick Buying, for example. Uh, so the crowd of sophisticated investors will follow their investment and they'll return some sort of economic benefit in, in the way of carry if there is a future sale event of the business. So AngelList focuses more on doing DD on the individual investors in the platform who then bring deals in. So it's finally a scalable model. Um, just looking at Crowdcube, um, my formatting seems to have stuffed up here, but anyway. Um, they're based in the UK. Uh, they have really been uh, the brainchild behind this direct equity crowdfunding model uh, globally in conjunction with Cedars. So both these companies in the UK found lots of different loopholes uh, to run their business in this, in this geography and really start to shape the way equity crowdfunding works. Um, in the last five years, they've raised almost 200 million pounds. Um, they've closed you know, almost 500 transactions. So you can start to see how scalable these global platforms are once this ecosystem and marketplace uh, starts to develop. The average investment in Crowdcube is pretty low compared to AngelList, which is up around $25,000, $30,000, <laughs> um, just under 2,000 pounds. This is because they typically have a minimum investment amount for their opportunities of about 10 pounds. Um, why you'd want to put £10 into a business which is private and you know, a low chance of failure or high chance of failure and low liquidity, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, they have a very low minimum investment threshold. Uh, in Equitize, our average investment amount is about $15,000 New Zealand. Um, and our minimum investment is usually around $1,000. Uh, so I thought we'd quickly go through an example of uh, an ECF or an equity crowdfunding campaign where the platform has actually raised their own money. Uh, Crowdcube's done it three or four times now. The most recent time, a couple of months ago, uh, they raised money on a $65 million or pound pre-money valuation, um, targeting to raise seven million pounds. Uh, however, well, I think it was up to six million pounds actually, but it went straight through that. Um, they raised this money in the space of about two weeks, uh, which is pretty unheard of considering the business is making a loss, they've been over five years, you know, they've got good top line revenue, uh, that are 24 times revenue multiple. For a business making a loss is, uh, is, is pretty high valuation, really. Um, but this goes to show some of the benefits for issuers raising capital through equity crowdfunding, uh, going to their own databases, usually retail investors. Um, you can get high valuations. You know, if you went to a strategic investor um, and ask them for a seven mil check, it would not be a 65 mil pre-money valuation for this business. Um, so having your crowd or your customers who love your product, they love your business, investing in your business, you can usually uh, use that emotion in a way to get a high valuation, uh, which isn't necessarily a good thing because if you're not, if you're not performing at your next funding round post this, uh, usually you have to have a down round, uh, which is not ideal. So AngelList, uh, being a VC syndicated platform, US based, they were founded in about 2010. Um, they've raised a similar amount of money uh, to Crowdcube with the conversion of currency. Although the, the main thing which I think is quite interesting when comparing these two models, considering they've been around for a similar amount of time, is looking at the number of capital raises at close. Um, talking before about how AngelList is a far more scalable uh, business model They've got each of their syndicates bringing in you know, four or five deals a year. Uh, when you've got you know, over 150 syndicates, you can really start to generate a lot of capital <coughs> And it's got a much higher success rate because you've got 
uh, angels which have experience um, cornerstoning the rounds and you know, getting other sophisticated investors and other VC funds sort of co-investing in those assets. Uh, so the time to close these transactions is also uh, very fast. Um, back in 2013, when AngelList was really just starting to get going, they had a valuation of $150 million US. Uh, I'm pretty sure recently they just completed another funding round for well over uh, a free money valuation of a, a billion dollars. Um, so they've really, really grown their business quite quickly. Uh, the other interesting thing about AngelList is uh, they hold all of their shares, uh, which they facilitate the, uh, the capital raises uh, within. Uh, they hold all of the, the shareholders within an AngelList nominee SPV type vehicle. And for managing that vehicle, they take a 5% upside of any investor profits, which is called carry. So of those 1,045 transactions, uh, they also get commission, but they're building an asset in every single one of those transactions that they're, they're completing. So they've effectively got 1,045 investments, which is pretty cool. And the companies which they're funding, they're ones like you know, Facebook and um, you know, Snapchat. They're, they're really decent businesses. Um, so a pretty impressive model. Now the way it works, uh, I'll run through it very quickly. You've got a lead syndicate uh, who uh, signs up to the platform. They get pre-vetted on the AngelList platform. Um, people can choose to co-invest with them if they agree to their carry terms. And the definition of carry is essentially the same as the VC fund. Uh, if you agree to co-invest with the lead angel or the lead syndicate, they get to share on your upside. So they take up to 25% of the profits that you make upon the sale of the business if there's a profit. Um, it's beneficial for all stakeholders. Uh, the company gets funding much faster. Uh, they get all of their shareholders in one shareholding uh, vehicle, which is a nominee. Uh, the lead angel gets more economic exposure to the transaction in the form of carry. Uh, the investors get exposure to deals which they've never been able to see before because you know, suddenly there's this motivation uh, for these uh, really cool deals to be given to other people in the ecosystem. So that's essentially how it works. At the moment there's 170 different syndicate leads in AngelList, uh, which is quite a few. Um, in Equitize, we've got about 12 syndicates at the moment, but I'll, I'll get to that a bit later. Um, and what we're seeing now in AngelList is because there's this democratisation of deal flow and no longer do VCs control all of the best deals going to them, demanding all these ridiculous terms like preference shares and board seats and you know, low valuations, they're going to platforms like AngelList to get really exciting you know, angels like you know, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, to lead their syndicated round. Uh, not demanding as high terms because they're not taking a huge clip of investment. Uh, and because this is happening, you've got VCs like these ones at the bottom, Sequoia, Clyde Perkins, who are some of the biggest VCs in the world and the most successful VCs in the world, are uh, now co-investing with angels on AngelList because they're not getting access to the best deal flow. So it's really cool because it's democratising uh, all this amazing deal flow in the market. Well, I think it's cool. Um, so the future of crowdfunding, the way we see it, and the way that we've built out our platform in Australia and New Zealand, and this is also because of the way that the regulations have evolved or not evolved uh, over the last six years, and who knows when they will change, it could be another six years. Um, Equitise have decided to sort of combine these two business models being direct equity crowdfunding uh, through our business operations in New Zealand, so taking uh, issuers and doing DD on them directly, which, as I said before, is a much more time-consuming business model, but it's the ECF business model which is most common. Uh, so doing that, uh, platforms like us get better commission. Um, you work harder to get the deals into the platform, but you're sharing the upside uh, through taking a percentage of the capital raise. But with syndicated deals, um, we managed to figure out a model that we could start running in Australia uh, to access seven or eight investors and sophisticated investors through allowing VCs and angel groups to close the residual of their round in our platform, um, basically copying that angel list model. Uh, so we use a nominee structure from New Zealand, um, which is far more streamlined and far less costly to operate. Uh, than it is to run a bear trust in Australia. I don't know if anyone here has tried to run numerous bear trusts, but it's quite expensive and quite risky legally. 
Uh, so we use a New Zealand nominee structure uh, to facilitate this same angel list uh, experience uh, for VC funds and angel groups uh, in Australia at the moment. Uh, in fact, we're hosting a, a very big uh, conference at the beginning of uh, February next year uh, with almost every single VC fund and family office in Australia coming to it so we can start to educate them about this model. Uh, so it should be quite exciting and a way to democratise uh, deal flow for you know, all the investors in the room which do want to get access to these deals which tend to close quite quickly because you know, VC funds tend to snap them up. But these are just some of the guys which are closing deals in our platform at the moment. Um, it's, as I said, uh, with the angelist experience, more beneficial uh, for us because it's less work. Um, they've got their own profiles and expertise. Uh, they can process their own deals and we share on the outside and so do the investors in the platform. Um, before I finish up, I thought I'd just run you through a couple of uh, syndicated case studies which uh, we've run through the platform very recently. Um, in New Zealand, there is a flight drink, or is a flight drink called One Above, um, which prevents jet lag. I think it's all a bit of a placebo effect, uh, but anyway, they're doing quite well and they sell these things for $15 a bottle. You might have seen them at the airport. Um, Kiwis doing funny things. No offence if there's any Kiwis in the room. Um, so this was a, a New Zealand uh, private placement that was cornerstoned by Mobac, uh, which is a venture capital fund, uh, who use our platform to, to close some deals. Um, K1W1 is a leading family office and a VC in New Zealand as well. Um, so they put about half a million dollars of cornerstone investment into one above. Um, they then tapped us on the shoulder and said, look, you know, this is a really good consumer products business. Um, can we use you guys to access the database of one above, of which there's I think, 100,000 different people in their mailing list, uh, to close out an investment round and you know, get this done quickly? Um, and the benefits, of course, being you get your customers to buy into the business and they become brand advocates and shareholders, not just uh, customers um, and you know, more loyal and all that sort of thing. So in the space of uh, a few weeks, we raised uh, almost $2 million from uh, almost 200 investors uh, in New Zealand and Australia, the one above. Um, so that was a, a Kiwi example. Uh, another example which we've done very recently, closed last week, is uh, Crazy Domains. Um, biggest hosting uh, business in Australia for websites and domains. Uh, I think they've got about 1.5 million domains registered just from Australia and New Zealand. So quite big. Um, they are IPOing on the ASX next Wednesday. Um, so stay tuned, it should go quite well. Um, Can Accord, uh, an investment bank based in Melbourne, uh, syndicated this deal through our platform um, to get the minimum ASX spread requirements. So there's, there's different reasons why syndicates do this, right? If you're a lead broker wanting to get spread for an IPO and you don't want to use any retail brokers because, let's be honest, they're going out of business and uh, they're a bit of a pain to deal with. Um, so they used us in on-market book build, uh, which is another sort of IPO platform to, to give spread to, to lead managers who are more institutional based um, to get as many names as possible for a 500k allocation. Uh, Canaccord went out and raised $25 million uh, from all their institutional investors. That was three times oversubscribed. So actually raised close to 100 million, had to scale them all back. So very, very high demand stock, yet they couldn't get the spread uh, from the retails. So they came to us and said, look, can we plug this to your, not plug, sell this to your, your retail uh, investor base through our retail app to sell? Uh, and we said yes, and um, we thought we'd be given a few weeks to do it, but they gave us uh, a week, uh, which is uh, pretty unheard of trying to get these things away so quickly. Um, but we managed to get them 168 names, um, capping each investor at 2.5K um, for an allocation on you know, approximately thereabouts. Um, so it just goes to show that you can do a lot of different things with, with equity crowdfunding through the, these different models which are evolving uh, globally. Uh, I think. That is essentially it for me. If, if you've got any questions, um, I'll give you my details after as well that have to answer uh, any questions. But thank you all very much for attending. I think a, a bigger turnout from last year uh, in Melbourne. So Sydney's winning.